The alleged massive attack on Iran, which was initially reported with a sense of alarm, has now been confirmed to have failed, reinforcing a narrative that has been building over the years. Iran has meticulously prepared to counter not only the Israeli military, but also the United States, which it views as an even more formidable adversary. This outcome was not entirely unexpected, especially given Iran's continuous efforts to bolster its defensive and deterrent capabilities over the past decade. What transpired in the early morning hours, where Israeli fighter jets launched missiles from far outside Iranian airspace, has sparked serious doubts about Israel's long-range capabilities and its ability to sustain a war against Iran in the future. This incident also underscores how vulnerable Israel's military operations are when conducted without regional support. Reports indicate that more than 100 Israeli fighter jets were involved in the operation, firing missiles from beyond Iranian airspace. This was clearly a calculated move, driven by the fear of engaging directly with Iran's formidable air defense systems, which have become increasingly sophisticated in recent years. Iran's air defenses were ready, and their performance in intercepting and neutralizing the incoming missiles has cemented Iran's deterrence capabilities. For years to come, this will serve as a warning that any potential large-scale military operation against Iran may not go as planned. A major takeaway from this failed offensive is how heavily the Israeli military relied on the cooperation and goodwill of Arab nations in the region. Had the Arab states chosen to close their airspace to Israeli jets, this attack might never have taken place at all. It's a subtle but critical reminder of how geopolitical alliances and regional politics play an equally important role in shaping military outcomes. Israel's military, while advanced, doesn't operate in isolation. The attack was a wake-up call about the potential fragility of its regional partnerships, which are vital to executing long-range strikes. One of the most striking elements of this story is how well some experts predicted this failure. Colonel Douglas McGregor, a retired U.S. Army officer and respected military strategist, was one such voice. Known for his incisive analysis of military conflicts, McGregor has become something of a reliable forecaster when it comes to complex military engagements, from Russia's invasion of Ukraine to potential conflicts involving Iran. As the attack unfolded, it almost seemed like he had insider information about how it would play out. Move down to Gaza, you're dealing with Egypt. And remember Egypt, uh, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, they've been heavily bribed for years by us to go along with what we wanted them to do vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Uh, that's something that they're reluctant to admit publicly, but it's true especially for Jordan and Egypt, who desperately need money. They have large populations. They cannot easily feed, clothe, school, house, without a, a, enormous assistance from the United States. And they've been told, you know, listen, if you be, get on the wrong side of this thing, we will cut you off. And, of course, the populations in Egypt and the population in Jordan, and in Jordan there are more than 11.5 million Palestinians. People don't realize that. Uh, they they don't care anymore. They want to get involved. They they want to join the fight, and I think at some point that will happen. Particularly if we see the Turks engage, and that will come, I think, after the Iranian counterstrike, when it becomes clear that the Iranians have devastated Israel. All of these are reasons why Mr. Netanyahu desperately wants us in the war, because he understands that he cannot prevail in this environment without us. So he's in a position where he either kills his way out of this, kill as many Arabs as possible, and then if anybody else gets involved, kill them, whether they're Turks or Iranians. But the bottom line, he's got to kill as many as possible and cleanse the state north of the river initially, well into Syria, well into Le uh, Lebanon, even, even if he can, all the way up to Beirut. Get rid of as many as there, the people there and then try then to attain some sort of peace settlement that leaves him in charge of most of this territory, and then he hopes to fill it with Jews. We are the instrument. If we don't go in and support him very strongly, 
If we don't back him, particularly after the Iranians counter strike, then he can't win. Now, if we support him, can he win? Uh, that's iffy. We haven't seen large numbers of our aircraft fly against uh, Russian S-400 air and missile defense systems. So that, that depends greatly on how we do, how well we perform. It also depends on what happens when we come under attack and how many missiles fall on us and how, how they target us at sea as well as being on the land. A lot of open questions. We don't know the answers. But I think it would be a mistake to assume that Iran, and for that matter, Turkey, will be pushovers in the future. I don't see it that way. I think these are going to be very tough nuts to crack, and I don't think they're going to crack. And Israel, on the other hand, may be the one that cracks, because it has the most to lose, in my judgment. You mentioned before that um, <clears throat> if there's a war between Iran and Israel, a larger war that is, that uh, Russia and uh, China would uh, seek to come to the assistance of Iran. Now, uh, did, do we have any information yet in terms of any weaponry which has been uh, transferred? I, you know, you hear about uh, their defense systems. I, th I think they're also sending the S four hundreds. Do you, do we know anything else about the capabilities? Because there's a lot of uncertainties about the capabilities of Iran, both uh, what it's built on its own, but also, of course, what is being supplied by uh, uh, friendly states. Well, we know that they've been given Iskander missiles. Those are medium-range ballistic missiles. One of those fell on the uh, Swedes and other NATO forces in eastern Ukraine recently near Poltava and was devastating. Uh, they they probably have access to more than that, to more longer-range missiles. Clearly, they have hypersonic missiles. We know that because they penetrated and struck targets at an Israeli military site. How many do they have? Uh, what kinds of different warheads? I don't know. Anything is possible. But I think they have enough that they can selectively target what they consider to be important military installations and people. Uh, so I think uh, they've got more than enough. Someone told me recently that they had the capacity to fire 400, the equivalent of 400 missiles and rockets uh, every hour for three or four or five days before reloading anything. Now, that may be an exaggeration, but it's, it's not impossible. Uh, I, we'll have to wait and see how this initial engagement goes uh, for the Israelis when they attack. That'll tell us a great deal. If their aircraft are lost, if it doesn't go that well, if they don't achieve what they, of course, we'll, we'll never be told, honestly, what they did or didn't achieve. We know that from experience, but we'll be able to know what happened. And then the Iranians counterstrike, uh, that's when we come in. I mean, we will come in. We have a thousand fighters ready to go. Uh, we have large numbers of bombers sitting down on Diego Garcia and in other locations. We can fly them all the way from Nebraska if we need to and drop enormous quantities of ordnance on Iran. Uh, the Russians have made it clear they will not stand by and watch Iran be destroyed. So the Russians now put some ships into, a, into an Iranian port recently and then sent a message and saying, don't attack Iran. Uh, I think the Russians would like nothing better than to see no war. But they have thousands of men on the ground, technicians and soldiers, who are hastily not only assembling air and missile defense capabilities, also building up the intelligence surveillance reconnaissance capability. They have moved pilots down there who can fly Iranian aircraft and other kinds of aircraft as needed. And I think we'll see a lot of uh, long-range ballistic missiles, maybe some that we didn't expect, but it will all be conventional initially, unless, of course, uh, Israel uses a tactical nuclear weapon, in which case the, then I guess the you know, so-called guardrails are completely abandoned, and you could see a nuclear warhead on a missile fired from Iran. McGregor pointed out that both Tel Aviv and Washington were likely gripped one. with fear about the potential fallout of a large-scale Iranian yeah, retaliation. Do, yeah, a a war with Iran towards, uh, wouldn't just be confined to the war, battlefield. Is, uh, it could trigger massive waves of refugees by, uh, flooding into wars, Europe, America, uh, and Turkey, destabilizing regions far beyond uh, the Middle East. 
But the most significant concern would be economic. McGregor highlighted the strategic importance of the Strait of Hormuz, a choke point through which a significant portion of the world's oil passes. If Iran were to retaliate by disrupting oil shipments in this region, the global economy could be brought to its knees. The potential ripple effects are staggering. Energy prices would skyrocket, stock markets would crash, and countries dependent on Middle Eastern oil could find themselves grappling with severe shortages. This brings us to another crucial layer of this analysis, the role of Russia. As McGregor astutely noted, Russia's antagonism towards the West, particularly in light of the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, adds a dangerous dimension to any future confrontation involving Iran. In recent years, Iran has developed closer ties with Moscow, and given the current geopolitical climate, it's not far-fetched to imagine Russia throwing its weight behind Tehran in the event of a full-scale war with the US or Israel. McGregor suggests that if war were to break out, Russia might supply Iran with advanced weaponry and military intelligence, much in the same way that NATO has been arming and supporting Ukraine against Russian aggression. The consequences of such an alliance would be dire for the West. Russia, already embittered by what it perceives as Western interference in Ukraine, could seek to use the conflict in the Middle East as a form of retribution. McGregor theorizes that Russian support could extend beyond supplying weapons. It might even include targeted attacks on U.S. assets in the region. Russian naval forces could go after American warships or dismantle U.S. military bases in retaliation for Western actions in Ukraine. This would elevate the conflict to an unprecedented level of danger, with multiple world powers entangled in a potentially catastrophic war. That the Trump administration, the future one, will be solidly in the Israeli camp and back what he wants to do. So under those circumstances, I think he's decided we have to attack, that is, Israel has to attack Iran before the election and get the war started before the election. Now, when does that happen? First or second or third of November? I don't know, but probably somewhere in there. Uh, so he'll wait for the additional air and missile defense forces to arrive. They'll be set up. And then I suspect he'll launch his attack, which I expect to be very powerful, as powerful as he can make it. The only question at this stage is, will he use a tactical nuclear weapon or two tactical nuclear weapons or three tactical nuclear weapons against Iran's alleged nuclear site? We have ultimately asked him not to do that, but he has these weapons and he's made it very clear that whatever we want is secondary to his and Israel's interests. And therefore, he will do what he thinks is appropriate. The problem, of course, of using a nuclear weapon, Glenn, is that you open the proverbial bottle and the genie comes out, and that makes it then legitimate for others to use those weapons against you. And we know that uh, Iran is close to the threshold uh, of producing warheads that can be weaponized on the missiles available to the Iranians. So uh, hopefully that won't happen, but it could. At any rate, that's the, that's the situation he's in right now. Now, then the Iranians will respond. And the question is, at this stage of the game is uh, how rapidly they will respond. Will they respond instantly? Uh, start unloading their missiles on Israel as soon as they discover that they are under attack? Or do they wait and then attack? I don't know. But I think that'll be devastating for Israel. It's going to be hard on Iran. But Iran is a nation of what? Almost 90 million people. Iran is the size of Europe, Western Europe. Of course, they have two large deserts internal to the country. There aren't very many people in those, obviously. Uh, so populations are concentrated in a few cities, but you do have a large rural population. So Iran is, is going to absorb it, and then they're going to strike back, and they will have every, amount, every bit of help that uh, Russia and China can provide to them. So when I see Blinken making his uh, regular trips to the Middle East, they keep focusing on the idea that, uh, you know, they're close to a ceasefire. They're trying to put pressure on Netanyahu to walk back this conflict. Uh, but at the same time, of course, there's no, uh, well, 
pressure actually being put in terms of limiting the weapons and or well, capabilities being delivered. And now we see this uh, uh, <clears throat> this uh, Thad uh, uh, air defense system as well being delivered. And as we pointed out, a very sophisticated system as well. How can we under- How should we understand the U.S. position? Are they do, do they have they given up on the idea of ceasefire, or are they? Uh, are they still uh, waiting for Israel to determine <clears throat> what the U.S. should do? Or it becomes very difficult to follow because the the, the signals they want to send it seems to differ very from the actual actions which are being taken. If you are uh, in one of the Arab states right now, or Iran, or Turkey, it's very obvious to you who is in charge. Mr. Netanyahu is in charge. And he doesn't ask for something, he demands it, and he gets it. And Amos Hochstein or uh, Tony Blinken, when they come into the region, are not treated seriously anymore, because as far as the Arabs and Turks and Persians are concerned, these people are simply repeating talking points from Mr. Netanyahu, and they are Mr. Netanyahu's agents. We are viewed through that lens right now. So I don't think there's any expectation in the region that anything we say about our uh, our readiness to urge Israel to do something else means anything. I think they fully expect to be hit and be hit very hard, and I think they will hit back very hard. We'll see what it looks like the day after the Iranians have struck back. Well, the thing with Israel, though, is uh, it's um, the, the reluctance to make any peace settlements, any peace agreements with its neighbors, or primarily the Palestinians, uh, which yeah creates the need, I guess, to have uh, what they refer to as you know mowing the grass every now and then to uh, attack both uh, military and civilian targets to perpetuate the weakness of neighbors, given that they don't have any permanent peace with them. The, but uh, if the United States would want to reverse or <laughs> put an end to this, for, the, surely they they would need to push through a settlement. But I but I guess. This is uh, there's no chance anymore, is there? Because I keep also hearing Washington suggesting that you know they're even close to a ceasefire, and then uh, they barely made the statement before Netanyahu uh, contested, saying that they're not willing to make any concessions or pull back. So uh, is, is is this all messaging then, or I, it's just it becomes very difficult to uh, follow at times. Uh, Glenn, uh, you, if you go back to October seventh last year, the initial response and in the, in the weeks that followed demonstrated that Israel was not interested in any future arrangement that would include any sort of Palestinian state, or for that matter, even a ceasefire with uh, the people in Gaza, Hamas. And since then, the war has only expanded. I don't think uh, anyone in the Middle East harbors any illusions, regardless of what we say. And I think if anybody believes that there's a future for a two-front, or excuse me, a two-state solution, they're hopelessly delusional. There isn't. If you travel to the capitals in the region, and I'm talking to several people who have traveled to them, and (coughs) recently and spoken to people very close to the top, people that work closely with Mr. or General Sisi, people who work for uh, Crown Prince Mohammed uh, bin Salman, uh, people that are dealing with uh, the Emirates and also in Qatar and Ankara, they they have all said the same thing. Everyone's attitude is no more Balfour Declaration. That's over. So as far as they're concerned, there will be no compromise. And they don't take us seriously. They don't see us as an honest broker because they see us as essentially manipulated by their enemy. We are the creature of Israel. We are the dog that's being wagged by the tail. The failed Israeli attack on Iran should therefore be viewed not just in isolation, but as a critical moment in a much larger and more complex geopolitical puzzle. Iran's successful defense was the result of years of preparation, and it sends a message to both Israel and the United States that any future offensive will not come without heavy consequences. 
Iran has made it clear that its deterrence strategy built on a combination of advanced air defense systems, missile technology, and regional alliances has the potential to stave off even the most sophisticated military operations. Moreover, this situation illustrates the delicate balance of power in the Middle East. Israel, despite its military superiority, faces significant challenges when it comes to launching unilateral operations against Iran. Its reliance on Arab airspace and regional cooperation shows that its strategic position isn't as invulnerable as it might seem. Meanwhile, Iran's growing confidence in its military capabilities, coupled with its strategic partnership with Russia, creates a new dynamic that could reshape the balance of power in the region. For the United States, this failed attack serves as a reminder of the complexities involved in any confrontation with Iran. While Washington has long relied on its military might, to project power in the Middle East, it must now contend with the reality that Iran, backed by Russia, is a far more formidable adversary than in previous decades. A war with Iran would not just be a regional conflict. It would have global ramifications, from destabilizing oil markets to potentially dragging other world powers, like Russia, into the fray. The failed Israeli offensive on Iran marks a turning point in the ongoing tensions between these two nations. It highlights the strategic calculations, alliances and military preparations that both sides have been making for years. For Iran, the success of its air defenses is a clear victory, showcasing its ability to defend against even the most sophisticated attacks. For Israel and the United States, this failure serves as a stark warning of the dangers that lie ahead if they attempt to escalate the situation further. And with Russia lurking in the background, ready to tip the scales, the geopolitical landscape in the Middle East has never been more complex or more fraught with potential consequences.